So you guys prayed Salah when you were literally tied down yeah. like cargo on a plane, yeah. hooded, yeah. Um, hearing people shouting, not knowing where you're going, and you guys yeah. were praying so, Maghrib and Jama'ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you come back to your cell to find that the Quran has been spat upon or it has um, boot prints on it. But I saw this dream and in the dream I saw that I'm uh, walking in a prison yard, round and round and round, surrounded by soldiers holding guns. She said, were you, were you in Guantanamo? I said, yes, I was. She said, so was I. I said, there weren't any sisters in Guantanamo as prisoners. Mm -hmm. In my time, at least three Guantanamo soldiers uh, accepted Islam. What the? I have to say, the worst thing is, is watching a person being beaten to death. Assalamu alaikum guys and welcome to another episode of Declassified. My guest today was born in the UK. He was staying in Pakistan when he was taken to Bagram where he was tortured and eventually taken to Guantanamo where he was tortured some more. He has since not been convicted of any crime. In fact, he has received an out of court settlement by the government and is currently a free man. His story is not only fascinating, but riddled with timeless lessons that we can benefit from years and years after his tragedy. He has since been on numerous platforms to talk about his experiences and the ongoing flaws in policy which aims to tackle the war on terror. Such as he's been on the BBC, Channel 4, Oxford Union, Vice, Russell Brand, Al Jazeera, Russia Today with Ju Julian Assange, Islam Channel and the likes. He's since written a book called Enemy Combatant and has a documentary on YouTube which I purchased and watched. And for me to purchase something, it's got to be, it's got to be legit. It's called The Confession and to top it all off, he works for CAGE to help other people wrongly convicted under terrorism legislations. I present to you today the Iron Man himself, the American Nightmare, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Tiger Uppercut, the Punjabi Power Ranger, Mozambique. <laughs> Salaamu Alaikum bro. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Um, I've been on many, many platforms more than, than, than I can remember, but I've never been introduced as a Punjabi um, Power Ranger. Power Ranger, especially because <laughs> I'm not Punjabi. <laughs> what? what? Oh, uh, Don't let the facts get in the way God, of a good story. That's, that's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to sort out my uh, research department, which is, which is me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Literally, the, uh, the last couple of days have just been me just watching Muslims uh, interviews, learning about his experience. And to be honest, uh, I normally don't get nervous with regards to interviews. But here, um, honestly, with someone who's been through so much, I, I feel humbled, I feel overwhelmed. And I feel it a privilege that Alhamdulillah, I'm able to sit here and speak to someone who's been through so much. And mashallah, come out alive. I mean, if if there is such thing as a as a hero or, or someone that needs to be recognized it is people that live through tragedy and come out still with a with a smile on their face You're smiling all the way to jannah <laughs> that's <laughs> that, that's it uh, let's let's start off because um what what year were you released officially I was released in 2005 in january 2005 yeah. it's now 2019 you, you have gone to uh, many platforms and spoken at many events and still continue to speak at many media platforms. I guess my question to you first and foremost is why do you think it's important for us to know about this experience considering it's happened so long ago? That's a very good question and I think you're absolutely right because the truth for me is that this my incarceration was relatively short compared compared to a large number of prisoners, including one from here, right in South London, um, 
who was my friend Shakarama, he was held uh, for 14 years and released in 2015. Mm. Um, it, the reason why uh, it's important for me to make sure that this story is heard isn't so that they hear my story. I'm just a vehicle to tell other stories. And there are still 40 prisoners in Guantanamo. Um, they are still under being held without charge or trial. They are still, several of them have been tortured physically, psychologically, mentally. Some of them had children that they've never seen to this day. Some of them had relatives who have died, passed away whilst they're in being held in this place. And for reasons why that we understand that whether it's Bush, whether it's Obama, whether it's Trump, Guantanamo has remained open. It's, you know, Guantanamo is as American as apple pie. That's the truth. And people need to get that part. With, with regards to Guantanamo, well, one thing the audience may not know is Guantanamo, ironically, it's not in America, is it? No, but America is in Guantanamo. <laughs> America is I mean, in Guantanamo. One of the things I say often, I say, you know, some people say, um, you know, I can't, I can't travel to America because America's got this Muslim travel ban. I said, don't worry, there'll be a day when they come to you, oh, <laughs> as they did to me. Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of the, you know, the, the irony. But yeah, they came and they have been in possession of Guantanamo, the, the, the part of the island that is in U.S. military um, control and has been since the Spanish Civil War of 1912 or something like that. Um, and they've held this offshore base to detain people without charge or trial because they can say, this is not really our territory, our laws don't work here. That's mm. absolutely one of the reasons why they sent people to Guantanamo, to say, wow. and, uh, our law, our legal system doesn't work here. We've got, it's, got, a, we've got a separate legal system. It's like a loophole, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, yeah. Somebody even like myself, it's very difficult to imagine because we, we live in England and we're, we're told about, you know, very high-flying ideals like democracy and human rights and everything mm -hmm. but when we when we hear of Guantanamo or whatnot we hear that there are human rights abuses but people tend not to go that deep into it we don't really know what it actually is we have this high and mighty kind of feeling that okay when surely our people aren't going to be that bad so what just for the the viewers and myself what would you say um are some of the horrors that you faced there? Some of the horrors that I witnessed or, or faced, uh, they're, they're kind of well recorded. Most people know about them. I've said them again, but it's, it's. I have to say, the worst thing is is watching a person being beaten to death. Um, and that's what I saw in Bagram. I saw an, a, a, an Afghani prisoner. His name was Dilawar. His case is widely documented. It features in a documentary film called Taxi to the Dark Side, which won the Oscar for Best Documentary in 2008. And this was about a, a taxi driver who I saw with his hands tied above uh, his head to the top of the cage, being beaten physically until he was actually killed. And um, this is the US uh, autopsy report, military autopsy report said that had he survived, he would have his leg, which they kicked repeatedly, would have required amputation. Um, and the reason why they kicked him so much is because they found it amusing that every time they kick him, he says, Allah, Allah. So wow. he was kicked over a hundred times that night in, in, in his thigh in, with what's known as the peroneal strike, which is a, a Thai boxing style kick to the thigh to <sighs> subdue a prisoner. So that's probably the worst thing I saw. I, I, I was subjected to the sounds of a woman screaming that I was led to believe was my wife being tortured in May of 2002. Um, and that was both FBI agents and CIA. So some people say, oh, the FBI wasn't involved because they're the squeaky clean good guys. Mm. Uh, but in this theater here where there was no rules, no, no accountability, everybody was doing everything that they could get away with and knew that they could get away with. Seeing someone die in front of your eyes, well, what do you do after that? What, what went through your mind? Um, how, do you, how do you even see something like so that? So I, I didn't know about his death until much later. I only about, uh, the, the irony is I learned about his death from American inter in interrogators. Uh, and I'd, we, there was a rumor that he'd been killed that night. So they dragged him away from the cell. They took him upstairs and they beat him more. So he wasn't dead at the point which I saw him. Um, but he died that night. And the way I found out was a year later when I was in solitary confinement, two American soul, um, interrogators from a special branch, some, the equivalent of special branch, come along and showed me pictures of soldiers who were the um, perpetrators and the body of this um, uh, taxi driver, Dilawar. And they asked me if I could identify who were the soldiers who killed him and if I could identify his body. And ironically, I was held without charge or trial in solitary confinement, <laughs> whether I'd be willing to be a, a witness in a trial against these soldiers. And I said, seriously? 
mm. or are you going to take me by force? You've, you've, how, what you, how are you going to present me in the court? Yeah. Uh, and of course, it never happened. They, they, the, the soldiers involved in his killing were given a, a dishonorable discharge and three months in a military brig, and that was it. You said solitary confinement. Yeah. Two years? Two years, yeah. I don't know uh, the exact statistic, but they said something like possibly two months is enough for a person to start going insane. Mm. How on earth do you survive two years by yourself? Um, it's difficult, and but as, I, as again, I say that I my time, I compare it with my friends, others who were in Guantanamo for 14 years, of which they spent eight, nine, ten years in solitary confinement, isolated from the rest of the prisoners, from the rest of the world. Um, so I think it's possible. It, it, you And people, not only do they come out normal, they come out stronger than they ever have before. Why? How? What's the process? Um, multiple things for me. It was my deen, reading the Quran, learning it and, and making its verses relevant to me there and then that I'd never felt before. Um, planning, hoping, uh, talking to some of the soldiers who were decent people who would uh, pass little snippets of information or little bits of food or whatever it was. They would do that, yeah? Some of the soldiers would do that at great risk to themselves. So there's all there's a mixture of different things that uh, allows a person to pass through that. But there's no getting away from the fact that uh, there are times when you will lose it, you will crack, you will scream, you will shout, you will cry, you will punch, you will kick. You. I did those things when I felt at my worst um, physical and, and psychological what, state. What, what kind of led you to that? Because <coughs> I'm just trying to imagine, it's a pathetic comparison, but let's just say Sunday, no one's home, and you've got nothing to do, and you're just there, just just waiting for time to pass whilst you're waiting for, I don't know, someone to arrive or something. But to kind of be in a room where you know it's just going to be like that for God knows how long and time doesn't end. I uh, you have to uh, actually resign yourself. I mean, you start asking things about, you know, Muslims, we believe in fate, in Qadr and so forth. Right? What does that mean? What does it actually mean to believe in Qadr? Mm. You don't know what your fate is going to be. You can only say afterwards, oh yeah, that was my fate. But when you're in a, when in a situation, you really cannot control anything. You've got nothing. I mean, even the water that comes in your cell is not in your control. The mm. light is not in your control. You don't get to see uh, outside. You don't know whether it's day or night. You don't know whether it's Salah time. You don't know whether it's um, any of those things. You don't have a calendar. You don't get letters. You don't. That's all of this, mad. no radio, no TV, nothing. Not even what a convicted serial killer would get. You don't get any of those things. So then you have to resign yourself to your fate because you say here and this time now, nothing is in my control. It's all in the hands of Allah entirely. If I go home in 10 years or if I go home in 10 days, I have absolutely no control. Did they allow you books? They did. Um, over a period of time, they did. And the funny thing was that they would, the, the National Geographic, they used to love to give us National Geographics from the 1950s and the 60s. So, you know, these are like collector's items almost that they'd get. Wow. Know. And, um, but they'd ensure that any map of any country in any part of the world has been ripped out or blacked out. Because, you know, if you look at maps, you might start thinking of geography. And if you think of geography, you might start thinking about your own geography. And if you start thinking about that, you might be thinking about escape and how, oh. which direction you go. <laughs> so it's the it's a ludicrous way of looking at um, prisoner security. But you know, there there you go. I'm I'm very interested about this time that you you just had enough, and then um, you said you came to your breaking point. Huh. During your two years, when did that time come, and what kind of led you to that? Um, I'd been almost two years in solitary confinement in it's in a cell that's about eight foot by six foot um, where there's no window that you've got you're entirely closed in, in, in a space where you can barely move more than three steps either direction uh, and 24 hours is a there's no window there's no window no no you don't know whether it's day or night you, you, you have no idea um, and there's a guard constantly watching you and that guard may or may not be good it just depends on the kind of a rotation of shifts at that point the point at that at which happened um, was literally when I was pacing one day, back and forth, three steps forward, three steps back, three, again and again, back and forth, back and forth. And I started to tell myself, oh gosh, I've become like one of those animals inside a cage. I, if you ever go to the zoo, sometimes you see an animal, it will pace, especially some of these big cats. And that's what I, the word animal kept on going on it in my head again and again and again. And that's that was the, the trigger. So the, the soldier that was sitting there, he got the brunt of my anger and... And I'm normally very calm and collected. Mm. That he got the brunt of it totally. 
And then they sent in a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist to come and talk to me. It's the first time in my life I've seen a psychiatrist, but she's in full military gear. Mm. So I know she's going to try and mess with my mind. And she says to me, uh, have you ever considered taking your trousers off, wrapping them around your neck, threading your sheet through the trousers to make a noose and tying it to the top corner of the, uh, of the cage to, 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 to kill yourself? I thought to myself, no, not until you put that in my head. The so psychologist is giving you advice on how to end your life. Yeah, well, the, you know, psyops. This is what psyops was, and I, you know, I psychological don't know. warfare. Yeah, I don't know who was telling who what to do. Was it the psychiatrists and the psychologists? Were they creating the environment for the military to operate in, or was it the military telling them to do it? You know, who was in control? I still have to ask that question. You you also mentioned in in other documentaries as well that as soon as you went there, you were literally sc- um, stripped. Uh, shaved your beard, your hair, everything. Just, just walk us through that experience from someone that's literally just been picked up. They don't know where they are, and and suddenly all of this is happening. People spitting. I mean, the, Tommy Robinson talks about his experience, which is absolutely pathetic compared to your one. Yeah. I mean, just but but just being spat at. If somebody does that hair, I mean, it's enough for you to start a fist fight with someone like. Oh, Blood, yeah. did you spit at me? Yeah, and it's a technical assault, you know, technically. Um, so th- when I was handed over by the Pakistani um, intelligence to the Americans, I th- this was the first time I'd heard the U.S. military, and I asked one of them, I was, I was hooded, my hands were shackled. I said, you're not going to abuse us, are you? Because I was in a line of other prisoners who had who'd also been captured around Pakistan and being sent to the Americans. So they were surprised to hear a, a British voice. And one of the voices said, no, son, we don't do that. <laughs> he was lying through his back teeth. Mm. Um, so the moment they took me then uh, and literally put me into a bowing position with my hands behind my back and forced me onto this plane and um, strapped my legs, strapped my hands, strapped my, my, my head and then flew me off from there into Kandahar, which was an air base, US air base run in Afghanistan. And then there the abuse began. That's when they dragged me through the cold, freezing mud and uh, stripped off my clothes with a knife. Um, spat, screaming, square. I mean, the funniest thing was to hear these guys swearing in Arabic. They weren't Arabs and they didn't mm. sound like they were swearing. They thought they were swearing in Arabic. Uh, and they were doing it to human. It was all part of humiliation. Mm. And shaved our hair off, shaved my hair off, took photographs. This camera flashes all over the place. Um, spitting, kicking, punching. They sprayed this lime stuff on us. Um, and then dogs, they brought dogs to, to literally terrify us in front of us and dragging us in this way into this interrogation tent and walking there literally with nothing, um, shackled in an interrogation tent. And they're asking every single person, when's the last time you saw Bin Laden? When's the last time you saw Mullah Umar? And then it's not as if they're even waiting for the answer next and then they dress us in these um, jumpsuits and then take us into this uh, converted barn, a steel barn in an Afghan you know, uh, wasteland. You couldn't make wudu, no water to make wudu, so we were making wudu on, um, on the dust on the ground. So, uh, uh, so all of these sorts of things. It the just soldiers, you... when they, they, they saw you do that, mm. what, was their, what was their reaction? I remember uh, there was one interview, I think, where you were saying you were on an aeroplane and then you guys were about to pray or you were in the middle of prayer and the guy comes to yeah. you with a knife. Yeah. So th- was that on your way to Afghanistan? Yeah, so this was on that same flight that I was talking to you about okay. earlier on. So what, what happened is that I was literally seated on the trans- the, the, the floor of this transport plane. We'd been shackled up and, and literally tied down to the, to the floor like cargo, with cargo um, straps. Wow. But I noticed somehow that there's, there's somebody next to me. I'm not by myself. I knew I wasn't by myself. And then I ended up speaking to the brother who was on the left. He's a Libyan. And we started speaking. And salam alaikum salam. And we asked where, where, where we're from. And the most important thing on his mind was salah. Have you, have you prayed Salat al-Maghrib? Salat. I, I, honestly, I didn't even know it was Salat al-Maghrib. I didn't know. I would argue you say, did I even know Salat al-Maghrib exists at that point? Yeah. Um, but he reminded me, subhanAllah, he really reminded me that it doesn't matter where you are, what condition you're in, the Salat is, is, uh, is an obligation. So you guys prayed Salat when you were literally tied down yeah. like cargo on a plane, yeah. hooded, yeah. 
um, hearing people shouting, not knowing where you're going, and you guys yeah. were praying so, Maghrib and Jama. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and at this point, somebody, all that he must, a soldier must have heard us, and I was told that they don't draw weapons on the airplane. Um, uh, firearms on the airplane because if they shoot, it could damage the fuselage and make, possibly bring the plane down. So he bought a knife. He took a knife out and he put it to my neck, and he said, "If you speak again, I'll slit your throat." Of course, I hadn't spoken. Mm. I mean, for the pr- the next thing that he that happened is that the brother next to me he said, "Allahu Akbar," and he began. Well, he didn't raise his hands, but yeah. he his hands were tied behind his back. But he said, "Allahu Akbar," after that threat. After that, because that's it. You're in the in the state of prayer. And it doesn't matter what you're saying. It doesn't matter what they're going to do to us at that point. We're not going to break our prayer. So he just walked off. I Mitzvah thought he prayer. would have at least broken his salah. No, because no. first, worse, he, I don't think he could see the knife. Mm. <laughs> the knife was on my neck. The second was that I think even with, with the brothers, it, was, it doesn't matter. Once you've entered that state, nothing will take you out unless they kill you. Wow. I mean, when you watch certain movies, they say, oh, they've got a picture of their wife or they're going to go home and they, they, they kind of picture some happy memories or, or, or something. So what, what would you say uh, got you through it? I mean, you, you've mentioned certain verses of the Quran. It would be good if you could specify like which story or which verse or which thought, which memory, which ideal, which idea, what thing in the past. So, of course, there's uh, from sort of... Uh Al-Ankabut uh, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَحَسَبَ النَّاسَ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يَفْتُنُونَ Do people consider that they will believe, say they believe, say they believe and that they will not be tested uh, And he continues to say that we've tested those who uh, who came before وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَ الَّذِينَ صَدُقُوا وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ And we know the truth from the liars from that um, so I, that was it. That verse, those ayahs, stuck in my face, as they now apply to you. The verses from Surah Yusuf alayhi salam that reads from an, as an entire story about uh, his his ordeal and his mission. Uh, again, I read it. I've read it before many times, but this time around, when I read it, I used to burst out into tears because of the effects of how, how I felt. This, he's thrown into prison for a crime he doesn't commit. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places him in, in, a, in, a, in a position where he can say to his brothers, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم There's no vengeance upon you this day. Um, that for me was how could, they did all of this to, the, to him. And yet his real reaction is that had they not done this to him, he wouldn't be in this place where he is now. So it was a prophecy that he knew was going to happen. It's what he told his father um, about the, the, the sun and the moon and the stars. And now it's come true. So why seek vengeance? So that's that's in terms of the Quran. With regards to other things, were there some memories or something? Or? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, being a father, um, I had three children at the time, and the fourth one was about to be born, but I wouldn't get to see him until I was released. So there was all of that, and that's probably. I mean, for any person, any father, any parent, it's. The, <coughs> It's the most destructive thing. It's the most destructive thing. Um, and the Americans, they played on that. So they, during a particular interrogation period over a month, they bought pictures of my children and they waved them in front of me. And they, <coughs> they, they suggested, insinuated that the children are in custody alongside my, the mother, alongside my wife. And, wow, uh, what do you do in that situation? Because you don't know if they're lying or they're bluffing. Yeah, and so simultaneously <coughs> while, I'm, while they're doing that and I'm tied up, they, there's a scare sound of a woman screaming in the next cell. Oh my God. So this was all very, very, by, by purpose, by intention they were doing this. So of course what goes through your mind is two things. Surrender, give them anything they want, mm. sign whatever it is that they want. Or go insane and try to kill whoever you can with your shackled hands. I mean, you know, So what did you do? I said to them, that, you know, please stop whatever it is you're doing. Leave my family alone. And uh, whatever it is you want, I'll sign. I'll confess. Hence the confession. Is um, that when you did yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. That's initially with how it began, yeah. Would you say that there's certain inexplicable things that you heard or saw in prison? Like things from the unseen or just, just dreams that you had? Only one. Uh, but the dream I had it was 1994 
uh, and the dream came true in 2001. And 94, I could not have envisaged. I had no idea that this was the trajectory that I may end up on. But I saw this dream, and in the dream I saw that I'm uh, walking in a prison yard, round and round and round, surrounded by soldiers holding guns, and that somebody shouts to me that something's going to happen, and uh, all of a sudden people are shot and they all start falling down. I'm the only one left alive, and uh, somebody shouts again that your child's going to be born, but you're not going to see the child. Wow. And then um, I... Uh, I hear a voice that says, raise your hands and ask Allah to deliver you from this, um, from this humiliation. So in the dream, my hands go up and they go, keep going up and up and up until they pass this, the roof and they go into the clouds. So my hands are in the clouds. You know, like, and uh, I make this dua, oh, Allah remove this uh, humiliation from us. Mm. And uh, I begin to cry in my dream and I wake up crying. I woke up next to my wife in reality crying. And she asked me what happened, so I like, relayed the dream to her. And when they took me to Bagram, and the situation was almost exactly that, I, I wrote back to her and saying, essentially, uh, th th just a few words, the dream came true. It was the only dream I ever told her about, and it's the only dream wow. that I could remember. Uh, walk us through an average day in Guantanamo. It varied, you know, the average day varies from where you are, and time, and place, and blocks that you're in. So there are different blocks for different people. I was in Camp Echo, which was maximum security isolation block, which was f a full solitary confinement. You have maximum no, security, yeah, no contact with any other prisoners at all. So, as an uh, just an example, I'll give you: if they wanted to take me out to what's known as recreation, that simply means you go into a, a, a chain link yard mm. where um, you are. Uh, you can this is about fifteen foot by fifteen foot, where you can walk for about fifteen minutes, twice a week, fifteen minutes. So it's thirty minutes a week. To take me out for that process, and I found I actually was kind of you know a bit chuffed that they do they're going to this. They have to call for infantry, infantry patrol with a vehicle with a fixed machine gun, growing around. Then they call for what they know as the military working dog with a handler, so it comes along and they have to watch you. Then two soldiers, they shackle you up. The way you are shackled out, you put your hands outside what's known as the bean hole of the door. They shackle your hands. And then there's a chain that goes from your hands to your waist and then from your waist to your feet. There's another uh, flap in the door where they chain your feet from. And then once you're completely shackled up, um, two guards hold you from one side, either side. And then one guard pulls out his, his gun from behind you and he walks like that. Oh behind God. you as you're walking out. and you can see i'm a short guy that's that's <laughs> exactly what i was gonna say i was gonna say a lot of the audience don't know you're a very small guy yeah, yeah. to have such uh, did you feel like a bit of an og like uh, you can't help it right you cannot help it you cannot help feeling that these guys are i must be somebody very serious even yeah. i didn't know who i was yeah. um so and then they take you into this oh cage God. and you're walking around there and there's all you these people be, looking at you. Yo, I'm a boss. <laughs> it reminds me of your interview on London Real, where you said humor played a, uh, a, a big part in kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, your, your, your sanity or just just getting through day by day there? Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it, it had to be. And then for, of course, it's this is part of you know, anybody who knows me at home. I often play practical jokes with the kids, the wife and, you know, jump around people, scare them, say funny things. And that. They didn't change that. Mm. So if they were trying to change us as human beings, that wasn't happening. They weren't changing us as human beings. We were just becoming more honed in on our skills. You know, that, it, that's remarkable. Sometimes people go to a certain workplace and there's a certain boss and there's certain rules and a person feels they have to change. You're telling us that exactly you, 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 you are at such an extreme place. But you're saying your identity, you're so strong in saying that your identity wasn't going to change and didn't change. No. I, I would have thought that that would have broken a person within a week being no. treated like that. Yeah. And so my, a lot of my work has been since my release, working with Cage and so forth, is uh, meeting with and interviewing and traveling the world, meeting former Guantanamo prisoners, you know, whether it's Pakistan, Afghanistan, Kenya, Sudan, the Arab world and so forth. I've met with so many of them, and now as let's just say this is mutawatir. You know, this is this is uh, agreed upon. Muttafaqan alay that there is every prisoner I've come across is the same. It's not just me. 
Mm. It's not just my experience. Shaka, as I told you, 14 years in Guantanamo. The guy is exactly the same as when I saw, I saw him. There's nothing. Oh. He's not changed at all. The only thing I would say is that we're a bit more weary. We're more world weary and we are more aware of the world uh, in that sense. Um, politically conscious. Politically more conscious, yeah. So mm. they politicized. The whole ex- experience has polit- made us politically far more aware th- than before. But otherwise, we it's, are it's, the same it's, people. It's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned politics why do you think it's made you more politically aware than you were before? And why weren't you politically aware before? Uh, I think in the past, I, I was to a degree aware. I, I think I would say about myself, I probably was. But I've become now obviously more because of more travel, meeting more people, see, hearing more experiences, people from outside of the Muslim world, experiences of people in Northern Ireland, the black community, the Chileans, South Africa, uh, and a wide range just to understand what happened to me. Was it just me? Or is it happening in other places and other circumstances? Mm. Uh, and of course, the latter is true. What was the impetus for you to kind of have this drive after? Because surely somebody who leaves Guantanamo, they just want to kind of keep, keep, keep to themselves and just kind of keep low and just get on with life. Uh, but probably more than anything else is I made the Americans a promise. When I found out about the death of Dilawa, the taxi driver, I said, I promise you, as Allah is my witness, I will never let you forget this. I will give witness, I will give testimony, I will make sure that the world knows what took place here. And I stuck to, I stuck to my promise. Wow. How do you constantly put yourself through that? And how do you then calm yourself down such that you are a functioning member of society? Uh, I think one of the things is, um, again, it reminds me of the, some of the soldiers would say, you know, if I was in your place, I would have gone crazy by now. I would be a terrorist mm. after all we've done to you. I said, you know, that's fine, but you guys are not my teachers. You, 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 my imprisoners, my jailers, my abusers, my torturers, my oppressor is not my teacher. And so for me, it's, it's kind of, it's very simple. My deen, I learned it from the Quran, from the Sunnah, from scholars, from people who I know and trust. And they never taught me that this is the way to react to a uh, uh, affliction and to calamity. They didn't teach me this way. I've so the learned. knowledge that you'd gathered before, before and during, okay. and during. Of course, there were scholars there. There were yeah, people of knowledge there. There was there are people now. There are people who remind you. And of course, as I said, we had access to the Quran. Our concentration on the meaning of the Quran. You know, in the past, I may have learned some things here and there, and, but now the words they come out at you. The verse in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa says, you know, Ya ladina amanu kunu qawwamin illahi shuhada bil qist wa la yajrimannakum shana'ana qawmin ala illa ta'dilu a'dilu hu aqrabu lil taqwa. O you who believe, stand up as just witnesses for Allah and do not allow your animosity or hatred of a people, and God, we hated them, uh, cause you to do them an injustice. Be just, that's closest to taqwa. Allah is telling me this. Um, and I'm reading this in Guantanamo and I'm learning it for the first time in Guantanamo. Did moments come where you your Islam came into question? Yes. Just talk us through that and how, how you kind of got through that. Um, I haven't really spoken about this much before. Uh, I won't go into the detail of it, but there was a period of time in Guantanamo when my Iman was rock bottom. Rock bottom. The reason, just, just to kind of put some context, is because nowadays small things happen to people uh, in comparison to, say, what you lot have gone through. And then it's very easy, people start questioning their religion, they start questioning certain things. So it'll be interesting to hear how somebody that's literally in like one of the pits, yeah. um, because it's expected for you to be in that situation. It's yeah. expected when things don't start looking right, you start raising your hands and you don't hear anything in, in, in response to that. What do you say? How many things can you remind yourself of before you start thinking for flip's yeah. sake? So that's true. I mean, and, and most people, if they're honest, they will say that. They will say that the Iman, like we know Iman as Muslims, it goes up and it goes down with your ability to do good deeds or not. So you're limited to how much good you can do there, um, if that's how you see it. But especially because you don't have many people. You don't have, in solitary crime, you don't have anybody around you. Yeah. And there was a Just period, thoughts and wasawis, isn't it? Yeah, and interrogators and guards who, you, who, who describe you as, as the worst of the worst. Wow. They're, 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 they're programmed to say that, yeah. though they're not all like that. Um, so what do you do in that situation? How do you, how do you, how do you get out of that? Um, the answer is you don't always get out of it. The answer is sometimes your, your faith is shaken. 
And again, this is mentioned in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, uh, you know, uh, Do you think that you'll enter Jannah and that the likes of those who came before you will not happen to you? That they were tested with hardships and difficulty and the earth shook underneath their feet. Until the Prophet and those who believed with him actually say, When is the help of Allah coming? And the response is, Allah inna nasrullahi qareeb. That the, that the help of Allah is close. What does close mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to ask yourself, When is that coming? When, when is that help coming? Um, in my case, I was so low that the help came in the, f in, in the shape of an American soldier, an American medic. And he said something to me that made me pick myself up in a way that I thought, subhanAllah, how could he be the messenger to bring me back to my faith, to, to, to connect to my faith in the same way? How could he be the one? And, and I remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah will bring aid and victory and support to this religion from anyone, from a fasik, from a fajr, and from even a disbeliever. And indeed, that's, he said a few words to me, which I won't repeat them, but it was suffice to say it brought me back into the direction that I needed to be. What did he say? I'm curious now. I, I can't tell you. The subject? The subject was connected to Salah. He, he encouraged you to yeah. pray? Yes, he did, yeah. yeah. Now, as people that are becoming more politically aware and you become more conscious of, of CIA through well documents and stuff that they've admitted to themselves, they mention stuff like mind control and, and psyops and stuff like this. Can you describe anything that you went through that you can describe as them doing an experiment on you or controlling your mind or putting in a hypnotic state? Or something along these lines. Yeah, there, there was a particularly strange period. There was, uh, and this period, uh, it's really bizarre. I even wrote a little poem about it, um, but I couldn't sleep. I, I literally had insomnia, so they gave me a pill. This prescribed me a pill, which they would come and literally administer to me every single day. They, they didn't give you a box of pills. You have to give the pill one by one, the medic. So it was really weird because. Um, they would sometimes come along and wake me up while I'm asleep to give me the sleeping pill if I'd fallen asleep. That's so stupid. <laughs> yeah. But that's the that's the kind of No wonder stupidity. you're saying it's an ox military intelligence is an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah. Um but one of the effects, um and I don't think I've spoken about this much either, uh maybe I have. One of the effects of this um drug was insane hallucinations. I'm not the kind of person wow. to hallucinate. I mean, insane hallucinations. I told you the National Geographic, right? I had a yeah. National Geographic. I opened it one day and there's a shark in there. But that shark, it jumped out and it tried to bite my face. That was the effect of these these pills they were giving me. It was really weird. Um, and another time, I think I was giving some kind of a lecture in, as if I'm some kind of a Roman senator. Um without knowing at all what the hell I'm saying. Um, and I only found out after the guards had told me, said, this is what you were doing and saying. And so it didn't, I didn't understand what it was doing to me, but it was doing something to me. And I, they were noting every single thing down. They were, they have a log book there where they'd log every one of your movements after 50, every 15 minutes, whichever soldiers there, they log everything that you do. Um, so I've always believed, many of the prisoners have also, also believed, who've got their own stories, that there was definitely experimentation taking place there. On other occasions, they came along and they forced us, they injected stuff into us. I didn't know what it was. I have no idea. It's not like you have a consent form or something. and They literally come along, grab your arm, put something in. I don't know what it was. Maybe it's some kind of a, um, you know, immunization, or maybe it's something else. I just don't know. Um, the did you guys ever go on hunger strike? Yeah, um, I did a couple of times, but not for a long, not for really long periods of time. But the brothers who I know very, very well, they did for a very long time. Um, and again, the hunger strikes, they weren't about we want to get out of here. Mm. The hunger strikes was for please do not abuse and desecrate the Quran, which is what they would do often. What? So we often would find in our cells 
that if we've been if taken out for interrogation or something or repression, mm. you come back to your cell to find that your Quran has been spat upon, or it has um, boot prints on it, or it's got swear words written on it, uh-huh. and so forth. So uh, a lot of the prisoners they protested, they uh, went on hunger strike because of that reason, and also because of strip searches and humiliation and so forth. It wasn't even about that we just want to be released. That was a different matter altogether. So the Quran, the desecration of the Quran in Guantanamo, in Bagram, in Kandahar was a huge thing. Mm. In my first days, I saw them rip the Quran and throw it into the toilet. And that's something they used to try to do, to again, to break our spirits. And some to brothers... To get you to do what, though? Just to break our spirits, just to break us, just to, to, to show us that you are totally humiliated. This is what we're doing to your Quran. And some of us got angry. Yeah. But others said, you know, you know, the Quran wasn't revealed into a book. Mm. It never came as a book. It was mm. written in a book because the defenders of the Quran were all getting killed. That's mm. why it was written in a book. Otherwise, the Quran was revealed by the, you know, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the angel Jibreel uh, to his heart. He was an unlettered mm. uh, prophet. And he taught it to his companions who memorized it. So we just started to learn memorization through the old way from brothers who would memorize it word of mouth. Heart to heart, isn't heart it? Heart, but, yeah. So that they, could, they couldn't even break that. Oh, no. yeah. Did you did you guys have conversations with each other? Yeah. Was there like bonds that were made? Oh, of course, yeah. Not just with them, even with the soldiers. Some of the soldiers, who, especially in solitary confinement, there was long-lasting friendships made with some of the soldiers, who were fr- my friends to this day. They visited me in my house and come and stayed there with me in my house. Um, with the prisoners, of course, there were there were prisoners from every part of the world you can imagine. Um, I was on a block with some Yemenis. One of them was supposed to be Osama bin Laden's driver. Um, you know, they had his cook there as well. Right? Osama yeah, bin Laden's cook. cook? His cook, they had as well. Um, there was an Australian brother. And there were, you know, people from all over the place. What did he say? What, what does Osama bin Laden like to eat? <laughs> from what I understand. What's his favorite was, salad? F- I mean, they ate really simple food. So it'd be, you know, like chane and, and dal and stuff like oh. that. And, you know, the odd, odd bit of meat every now and then. Um, so yeah, that's so all he's a flexitarian, of, yeah. Flexitarian, yeah, yeah. Is that what you call it? <laughs> yeah, if we have meat every so often. Is it? Okay, yeah. Oh. When it comes to soldiers, did you guys have theological discussions about? Oh, very much. Yeah. God, or yeah. what was, what was the high, what was the main kind of highlight discussion that you remember? Uh, so, a repeated discussion, which several of the the soldiers heard from many of the prisoners, is that. Um, uh, you know, Islam is the deen of the truth. Um, there's only Islam as a religion, and uh, that uh, the other religions have been falsified, they've been adulterated, they've been changed, and the proof is that the Quran is the living word of the God of Allah, and there is no change in it at all. Um, the Bible cannot make that testament. It cannot make that claim. We don't even know what the original Bible is. There are so many versions of it. Which language it's been written in is Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic but it was written, recorded in Latin and Hebrew and so forth. So it's very confusing. So nobody could explain it to them. So then you come along and say, well, the Quran is this. So there were some soldiers who completely didn't want to have anything to do with religion, but there were many who were practicing Baptists, Southern Baptist evangelicals. Um, and there would be healthy debate with some of them, and some of them it would be just uh, adversarial. So it, it varied. Um, my my sp- talks with a lot of the soldiers. I mean, I even made notes from the Bible. One of them tried to convert me to Christianity, and uh, I found that really fascinating because I studied the Bible before in the past, and I'd, I'd quote to him verses in the Bible that say that Jesus here is referred to in the Bible as the Son of Man. So, so you're literally giving dawah to the gods? Yeah, of course I was. And uh, did, they, did they were you... attempting to do the same thing to me. Some of them were. And by Allah's grace, in my time, at least three Guantanamo soldiers uh, accepted Islam. What the? Yeah, yeah. No way. Yeah, not from necessarily from my da'wah, but yeah. three of them accepted Islam. In fact, one of them is over When here. you were there? Yeah, yeah. One of them's actually come here. He's we've, we've taught together. His name is uh, Mustafa. His name was Terry Holbrooks, but he's to pray. Terry Holbrooks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this one is Mustafa. One is another is a sister. Uh, she was from Louisiana, uh, the Louisiana unit. She's a black sister, and she contacted us through email saying that she's accepted Islam and uh, she prays that all our brothers will be released soon. The best one, I think, uh, the most moving one was this sister. She contacted me on, on Facebook and uh, 
no, her, her, her profile, she's there with a the hijab, so obviously she looks like she's Muslim. So this was after when you came yeah, back? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and she said, were you in Guantanamo? I said, yes, I was. She said, so was I. I said, there weren't any sisters in Guantanamo as prisoners. Mm. She said, I wasn't a prisoner. Um, I was a guard. I thought, whoa. And then she goes to, on to explain how the love of Islam was sown into her heart when she saw how the Muslim prisoners there reacted to all the adversities that they were facing um, and that that had not been her experience of religion. Her experience of, of life had been if she, if she comes across a calamity or difficulty or hardship, she turns to drink and to boys and all, to all these things. But she said, when I saw you, you guys, um, your faith became even stronger, even more determined. Um, she said, I went back home and I accepted Islam. Wow. It's just a remarkable story. You know, uh, I mentioned Ramadan to you. So Ramadan, um, in the kunut, you know, in the prayer at the end of, of uh, the witr, sometimes you could hear if the imam was close to you, you could hear the dua that he's making. And it would be amazing because the sound of the sea, because we're near the sea, um, it's blowing it's blowing the barbed wire against the razor wire. And it's making this sound that's like a chime, like a wind chime. Uh -huh. I'm listening to the sound of the imam um, making a dua and sometimes in tears and we're all raising our hands like this with that in the in the background it was uh, it's hard to describe anything like that uh, it, it was very very powerful there were other times when uh, you know when you're fasting uh, you, you you're drained of energy you're mm. just drained and you know you've been doing your reading of Quran some brothers would do running on the spot and press ups and sit ups and whatever and just to keep themselves fit and they would do it even if they're fasting so then the adhan happens and there's uh, uh, after the adhan we eat after you know we eat and then we pray and so forth then after that after we've you know sated ourselves we start to break out into nasheeds <laughs> <laughs> so there's people singing in arabic in pashto in urdu in swahili in farsi and then there's a brother also used to rap in english you know, really so yeah 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 He's from London. So, yeah, there was all of that stuff was going on. And the guards would look at us thinking, what the hell have they got to sing about? <laughs> and that's another reason why they, they, many of them became enamored to some of the prisoners. For, for the Muslims watching, what would you say it's important and that you'd like to see or that you'd like to advise um, people to focus more on? Um, if there's anything I could say, then I, I would say that it's important that we understand our language and whatever language we're speaking and how to articulate it, that we ensure that our men and our women, I have to emphasize our women, are empowered and made to feel that their voice is strong. They are the silent victims in all of this. My wife, my daughters, uh, all the other brothers and their wives and their daughters, they sat behind and watched while this happened and suffered in silence. They don't have to suffer in silence. They could be the voice of their husbands. That is the most powerful um, voice that would advocate on behalf of their relative, uh, other than if you've got a father or a mother. Um, but either way, we need our community that it must be able to articulate itself in written form, in spoken form. It's important that uh, our future generations are taught about what are the potential pitfalls what may happen to us, what happened to those who came before us, as the Qur'an mentions again and again, not only just classical times or historical times in the Qur'an, but contemporary times. And we have to be prepared um, for struggle and sacrifice. Uh, that's something that we can learn from people across the board, even non-Muslims, we can understand that those who are prepared to sacrifice for their beliefs will in the end uh, achieve success, inshallah. With, with regards to Muslims that are afraid to speak out because they don't want to be labelled as uh, as fanatics or whatever, why do you think that that's a very slippery slope for us to go on? Because a lot of people are following that trend where they're sticking to very mainstream topics and they're staying away from politics and stuff like this. Well, the problem is that this is that this is a mainstream topic. It, it's not a. It's not a. Uh, if Muslims argue we don't do politics, well, they do actually because they often have a, a politician coming over to the mosque or to meet with them and, you know, say so they do do politics, but they do politics that is comfortable for some people and they don't do yeah. uncomfortable politics. Mm. They, they do, I, I would argue, they do politics a lot. Um, but the truth is, 
I'm going to say it as blunt as I can. I never heard a coward win a fight ever in the mm. history of mankind. And if you think you're in a fight, whatever it is, for human rights or for civil liberties or for um, our own personal rights, uh, cowardice isn't going to win you anything. The more you back down, the more you're going to get trodden upon. And if you think somehow that that is, uh, you know, fear mongering or so, then it's important that we look back at history. Uh, we can look at what happened in Northern Ireland. They were the terrorist community. Literally, uh, every law that was passed before 2000 was to do with the Irish community. And you can see how did they respond. They supported their prisoners. The good, the irony of Brexit today is the biggest thing is the backstop that they're talking about. And the backstop is all about we've got to maintain the Good Friday Agreement. Well, who did they made that with? They made that with the IRA, with people who were involved in bombing or trying to bomb Margaret Thatcher, killing the last Viceroy of India, hitting the MI5 building, firing rockets onto 10 Downing Street, killing 3,000 mm. people in that conflict. Wow. They, and who did they, you know, the Northern Irish community, they voted Bobby Sands in as an MP while he's on hunger strike in prison because they believed in their cause and they believed their cause was just and so forth. And in the end, those very terrorists, whatever you want to call them, Tony Blair is the one who made the peace deal mm. with these guys, with the, with the warring factions. And they will, and the amazing thing is there's no prevent in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Although there's tons of terrorism, even now there's bombs that you can take, there's no prevent there because it could all damage the uh, peace treaty, the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. So look at that. The community stood together. And uh, they might not be in a perfect situation, but it shows you what happens with the power of community. People were imprisoned there without charge or trial in, in, uh, in the 70s. This famous Bloody Sunday massacre happened because 25,000 people marched on the streets of Derry protesting the imprisonment without charge or trial of their prisoners. The British army opened fire on those protesters and you had Bloody Sunday. Then the IRA campaign started. But you can see the community was behind their prisoners. Mozambique, the Punjabi Power Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> this has been both enlightening, eye-opening and terrifying as well. Um, it really does, you know, it puts our lives into perspective and our comforts. And if someone like you that's been through all of that and you're still able to, you know, stay on your deen, pray your salah and still be um, a political advocate, then bloody hell. <laughs> bloody hell indeed. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we should be uh, more active with the luxury that, that we have. So bro, uh, Jazakallah once again. Jazakallah, it's my pleasure. And my pleasure. Uh, inshallah, we uh, meet again very soon. Inshallah.